Well, uh, thank you uh, for uh, both inviting me and for that, that nice welcome. And uh, I'll apologize ahead of time because it's going to be a little bit rambling and I'm trying to work from my phone. Um, so I guess I'll start when I was 16 because I couldn't read. Um, more specifically, I guess, I wouldn't read. I was a severe dyslexic who was lucky enough back in the 60s to have a second grade teacher who thought I might be dyslexic, which was an unknown thing at the time, as opposed to just stupid. Um, and she had, uh, with my parents, arranged for me to get a lot of tutoring, which arranged also can, you know, ended up with me uh, staying back a year or two in school. But I had been taught to read, but it was very, very difficult. And kids tend to avoid things that are very difficult. So by 16, I still didn't read. I did what most dyslexic kids did, which is uh, charm and, and cheat my way through school. There was nothing really I ever wanted to read, so what was the point? But that changed a summer, uh, at a summer at a summer camp. I was a junior counselor, uh, and uh, and that was the year that a, a little game called Dungeons and Dragons came out. We were in uh, I was grew born and raised in Chicago. The summer camp was in Wisconsin, which is uh, where Gary and uh, David lived, guys who created D and D. And so a college student uh, from their hometown brought a copy in that summer uh, to the summer camp and. Uh, we started playing that game, and that changed my whole life. Um, the unique mix of socialization, of problem solving, um, you know, of, of imagination, of being you know, swept away to a place and being kind of the hero um, uh, and heroes of a, of a movie uh, that was running in your own head was, was a very powerful combination. And it forced me to read, because uh, they were talking about trolls and elves and dwarves and orcs and things which Peter Jackson wouldn't put on screen for many decades to come. Uh, and so Tolkien became my C. Dick and Jane run, um, which is a really difficult version of C. Dick and Jane run, I might add. <laughs> um, but uh, eventually getting through that and then through the, the thin books that were the D&D game, um, I kind of just became obsessed with that, went home, um, talked to my high school friends and said, we need to go get this game. Uh, so at the time, there was only one place to buy that game, and that was at Gary Gygax's house, um, which was served as the office for TSR. So we got in our car, we drove up to Lake Geneva, um, and the six or eight of us kind of plowed in uh, to the first floor of the house and, and bought uh, the game from uh, the co-author, Dave Artisan, who was manning the store at the time. And that was a big sale in those days. Six copies of the game was a big deal. So he said, "Should I? Uh, you know, would you like me to run you on an adventure?" I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. You know. So we went into the kitchen, and they had arranged uh, the kitchen to have kind of this table that ran between the the kitchen and the breakfast nook, um, and and then split in half um, by uh, a piece of pegboard, um, which kind of served like a bank teller. Uh, window, if you will. There was a little half moon carved out right at the, at the bottom, at the table side. Uh, and and uh, Dave went to the other side, and we sat down in the, in the um, breakfast nook, so we couldn't see him. We could only hear him. Right? And he had a great voice. Um, and so he, this booming voice was echoing, you know, coming out from this mysterious location and taking us through this adventure. Every once in a while, a hand would reach out from underneath and say, roll these. <laughs> it was, uh, if there was anything that was going to sell my friends on, on role-playing games, it was Dave Arneson running us on that adventure, and it, it, it kind of became an impact for our whole lives, and I, I was lucky enough later in life to, to get to uh, know Dave very well and become a good friend and work with him on several projects and, and with Gary as well. Um, but that set, the, that set the bit really hard in me, um, that this kind of thing was, was going to be a unique component of my life. And, the joy of game mastering, of, of you know, weaving stories uh, in an interactive fashion with your friends, um, you know, is something that is kind of woven through my whole uh, my whole career in life. Uh, I was a lousy student before, of course, lying and, and charming my way through it. Now I was reading, but I was not reading school books. I was reading anything that had to do with my D and D game, um, uh, and um, uh, and then later Star Wars, which of course, you know. I immediately started making Star Wars games as soon as Star Wars came out. Um, so my lousy student kind of, kind of career continued um, uh, to a point where I didn't realize later, became a small legend in the high school uh, where uh, 
a very a great history teacher um, who very indebted to because he really set the bit deep for me for a love of history forever, uh, which has fueled so much of my work. Uh, but he, he started this uh, semester off by putting 100 uh, facts and names and dates on a board and said, at the end of the semester, your grade is going to be based upon your ability to tell me everything you know about one of these things. Well, one of those things was called Greek fire. Um, and that caught my attention because that's really useful in a, in a d and campaign. So I really <laughs> studied Greek fire. The other 99, I didn't really study. Um, and all the people in my game knew that. So when, at the end of the semester, the teacher stood up and said, Weissman, Greek fire, they actually booed. And um, they were like, it's rigged, it's rigged. Um, so later I learned that he then used that as a cautionary tale to all future students because, you know, running the odds, he said, only one guy is ever going to get away with that. And that's already happened, so it's not going to work for you. Um, being a lousy student in high school, my college career, uh, my college options were uh, very limited. Um, I was able to get, uh, I did love sailing and uh, had a overly romantic idea of what life at sea would be like. So I applied to the United States Merchant Marine Academy um, and being in the Midwest, no one had ever heard of that, so getting the congressional appointment was not hard. Um, showed up there and, and had a very rude awakening on many fronts. Uh, but. <laughs> Um, the one thing that, that I saw there that was kind of the next step in changing my life was they had just finished building a $50 million uh, bridge simulator that was designed to help captains um, uh, learn how to navigate into uh, ports, which are congested spaces. Uh, now, us cadets, we were never allowed to you know, use this thing, but we got to tour it once, and that's all it took. I looked at that thing and said, well, that's the future of entertainment. Right? The idea of being able to take what we do around the table at a role-playing game and add a audiovisual experience to it, which you know, meant that for people who weren't willing or able to invest the kind of imagination muscles um, to, to do that at the table, this could be a wider form of that kind of immersive experience. So like any logical kid, I immediately dropped out of school and went home and said, okay, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna take my, my Apple II, because I think if I can put enough Apple IIs together, and I could build that. Uh, I was wrong um, and fried the motherboards of, of several Apple IIs trying to do it, but, um, but was determined to stick with that. Um, I went out and tried to raise money for that um, and just small bit of advice, at least in those days, uh, a college dropout who's never built anything who goes to venture capitalists and tries to convince them that there's going to be a thing called computer games and we're going to build entertainment centers and people will buy tickets to it like movies doesn't go really well. Um, so uh, that didn't work, so I said, all right, well, I'll take some of these ideas and I'll apply them to uh, the pen and paper business. And that's how I started my, my first company, which was called FASA, and we did a whole bunch of role-playing games. I figured we'd be rich overnight, and, uh, and then I could afford to build the, the big computer simulator. Um, that didn't quite work that way. It took about um, eight years, but we eventually did have the money to throw away trying to, uh, to build this thing. And so uh, we opened up the Battletech Center, which was in... Uh, 1979 was the first uh, location-based entertainment that had uh, 3D immersive networked uh, games. Uh, and uh, that was an enormous experience. So it was um, obviously a huge amount of electrical engineering and software, but most importantly, it was uh, an education on socialization, right? Um, about how people play games together and how in the future we'd be playing games together through wires, right? Um, so at this point, I've been making games for an embarrassing long time. I'm about to celebrate my 40th year of professional game making, um, which um, just means I'm really old, and I have two sons who are now professional game makers as well, um, which means I see them a lot because, you know, they're hungry often. Um, <laughs> but um, what's, what's fascinating is the curve that we've lived through is that most of what uh, was science fiction when I started making games is now mundane technology. Um, it's, it's really, you know, been amazing, that curve. Uh, I mean, the, I have a little studio here in town. We're about to ship a, uh, a new turn-based version of Battletech. Yes, I know, I keep coming back to it time after time. But um, uh, that version that we're about to release, it would, I mean, even in my imagination, when I, when I was moving those little bits of piece of paper around 35 years ago and I made up that game, wasn't as vivid as what we're about to ship is. Uh, it's, it's just incredible, but at the end of the day, tech is not what gaming is about, right? 
Um, I really think that games and stories are what our brains were built for. Um, I think one of the things I found interesting over the last uh, number of years was uh, about the kind of view of how memory works from a neurological standpoint has been completely rewritten over the last decade. Uh, we used to have this kind of idea that there's a part of the brain where memories are stored. Uh, and more recently, uh, it appears that memories are stored in the sensory locations where they're experienced. So the smell of an experience is in one section, you know, that, that, that processes smell, sight, sound, so on. And when we go to recall something, we kind of send out a file request. Send me what you got on this thing, right, on this particular point in time. Uh, but our brains atrophy, those memories atrophy at different rates uh, based upon what kind of senses and, and, and things were most important to us. But of course, we don't, when we remember something, we don't have a lot of like seeing missing here. Instead, what our brain does is invent what's missing. It looks at patterns of your life and then fills in. Um, so we're really built to tell stories to ourselves and to others. Uh, and I think um, that's true on games as well. Uh, I mean, every, uh, every society that we have found across history, the archaeological evidence uh, includes finding games that they played. Uh, all the way back to, I mean, to any time that there's any archaeological evidence, no, there's always a game there. Bottom line is that we've been playing games from the very beginning. Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons uh, for that. I think first, there's nothing on the planet more interesting than other people. And games are a medium uh, and a context for engaging with other people, right? And sports, I think, at least from my point of view, sports are just games where humans are the playing pieces, right? They are all about that context. They're about that creating, uh, a, you know, a, a way and a common language to talk to each other, to engage with each other, to, you know, break down barriers between each other. Games provide that in a really wonderful way. Obviously, enormously powerful uh, in, in person when you play a game around a table with your friends, uh, but as we've seen over the last couple of decades, can also be really powerful uh, online, right? Um, I think one of the uh, things that we found that really interesting over time, um, we started a company called uh, 42 Entertainment. Uh, this was, uh, I had done uh, the first ARG with Steven Spielberg for his film Artificial Intelligence, and then a couple years later, um, started 42 to do I Love Lees. Uh, and, you know, that was a kind of a, the mechanism we were using was a boutique advertising uh, company because we were you know, doing these to promote other experiences like the launch of Halo 2 or uh, the, the Nolan Batman films or um, you know, uh, Trent Reznor's Year Zero, things like that. Um, and of course we would deliver to our, our customers all sorts of metrics about engagement and use and demographics and the kind of things that you would want from a marketing campaign. But the demographic that was, I mean, the metric that was most interesting to us um, became how many marriages came out of each of those experiences. Um, because it really spoke to us about the emotional connections that were taking place through the common medium of the passion for these stories and these games. Um, and so I think, you know, there's just endless counts of stories of how that, uh, how that emotion, emotional connection and, and games can provide that medium for, for socialization. Um, secondly, I think uh, that our brains uh, are really so much of it was evolved to, to answer the constant uh, puzzle of survival, right? Uh, there's a concept uh, called safe danger, right? Which is the idea that um, uh, we, the reason we enjoy things like roller coasters or horror movies or, uh, or games that, that make us feel in, uh, that we're at, at, at danger is because so much of our brain is built about how to respond to danger that we get, an, you know, we get a rush out of that, right? That we, we get the survival of that, even when it's fake danger, right? We're not really in danger, but we've con temporarily confused our brain to think we're in danger, provides us that same feedback, right? And it's, it's a powerful kind of feedback. I think there's a similar uh, response to what I would call kind of safe survival, right? So much of our brain is based on spatial reasoning, right? And that was there for a reason, because we needed, it was that key survival trait to understand physicality, to understand um, the kind of puzzles that come into how to survive within a physical space, and you know, being chased by, I was gonna say dinosaurs, but we all know that's not true. 
um, but <laughs> by large mammalian creatures. Uh, and, um, and I think that we have a similar joy for solving those puzzles as we do in um, the same kind of safe danger uh, kind of scenario. And so I think um, uh, the, when, we, when we have kind of tactical or strategic challenges, when we have uh, even emotional puzzles to solve that games can present us, um, we, uh, I think we get a joy out of that, that our brain has kind of just been evolved uh, to enjoy. Um, so I think, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and, and occasionally when you get old you look back and say, well, what, you know, what have I done? I realized in doing that that I've just done the same thing over and over again um, in a widely disparate number of ways. Uh, in essence, I just keep building the same stool, all right? The stool has three legs. It's socialization, it's storytelling, and it's the mechanics that bring those things together. Uh, and even though I've made every, I think every type of game there is, <laughs> um, if not, I'll keep looking uh, and keep trying. Uh, ultimately, to me, it's always solving for that same puzzle, finding a new, unique way to mix those, those things together. And that's kind of what I love about coming to work every day, is to find a, a, you know, a new way uh, to bring those things uh, together and to, uh, to experiment with um, and to uh, uh, just find ways to engage with other people because ultimately to me uh, that remains the ultimate puzzle <laughs> which is how can we you know enjoy each other in a unique way how can we use these these things to find out more about each other um, and to uh, and to experience stories which which in their own way expose us to more of the human condition so um, I think that's it I'll answer questions later So as somebody who's, who's um, like once a year tried to propose that we do an alternate reality game to clients um, and using I Love Bees as a case study, I was wondering if you could tell more about the development of, of that game and how you sold it and convinced Microsoft to spend the money to do it. Um, because whenever we propose, people just go, that's too weird. <laughs> Um, well, they are weird. Um, uh, even now, uh, what, 18 years after we did the first one, you'd think they'd be a little bit more normal. Um, so uh, I Love Bees was actually not a hard one to sell. They called, they called me. Um, uh, the hard one to sell was uh, the first one, which was uh, the beast for Steven Spielberg's AI. Um, and uh, that came about, uh, I was creative director for Microsoft Entertainment at the time, and we were uh, launching Xbox. Um, and we were looking for kind of high profile partnerships. So um, the management was excited to, you know, kind of uh, get a relationship with Steven Spielberg. The film we was working on uh, was AI. We went and, and, uh, and got a whole pitch from, from him and, and Kathleen Kennedy and uh, Katzenberg and they kind of laid out the whole story and this was like the highlight of my life because this, you know, Spielberg's like my all time ultimate hero, you know. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you know, my management, the, team said, so the guys above me, two tiers of me, so what do you think? And I was like, I think that was the best meeting of my ever life and we should not do this, right? Because this movie is not really the right movie for the audience that, that you know, we're trying to launch the platform with. It's a very emotional story of a son desperate for a mother's love, you know, not, not a lot of shit blows up, you know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And you know, when you're launching for the 1835 male audience, initially you want a lot of shit to blow up. Um, and so they said, oh, okay. And then came back uh, a month later and said, so we signed the deal. And it was a very big advance, so we have to make six games. And I was like, great, I'll get right on that. Um, and so uh, you know, tried to look at what we could do for those six titles. Uh, uh, realized, okay, well, we'll do one that's kind of very based on the movie. Um, the rest, I, I needed a kind of more dynamic and broader platform to put six, five other games against, and really I looked at the movie and said, all right, well, the backdrop of what was taking place in the movie is a very classic story that's happened many, many times throughout history, uh, which is that we conveniently dehumanize part of our society so that we can shamelessly exploit them, and eventually they fight back for those rights, right? And that's what was taking place here in this movie, that's the backdrop of which it was taking place. So can we, can we call that story to the foreground, right? And we can set our other games against that. 
Um, so I uh, started working with uh, Stephen on, on writing that story, bringing, bringing, building a history around it, because you know, linear, uh, especially you know, 20 years ago, um, people wrote the movie. They didn't write the world. Right? And so we now needed to write the world around his movie. Um, and so we started to do that. And then I realized we needed a way to tell that story of the world. And I'd been playing around with these concepts of how to whisper in a world that's based upon screaming. Right? We're so bombarded by marketing every day that we have all developed kind of this ability to filter out the noise of it. Right? It's like, like white noise in an airplane. After a couple minutes, you just don't hear it anymore. And, and that's what you know, we've, we've had to, just for self um, you know, safety, develop these abilities to filter out so much of our marketing messages. So I thought, well, what if, what if we flip that around? What, instead of screaming, we just whisper. Right? We build a whole bunch of really compelling content, and we hide it, and we don't tell anybody it exists. And then when they find it, they'll own it, and they'll communicate it to each other. Right? And it'll grow on its own accord, and we just completely stay mute about it. Right? Um, and that could be a really interesting way to tell a story um, and, and to have it kind of have some kind of you know, more uh, authenticity to it. Uh, so I went to my bosses and said, uh, here's what I think we should do. We should spend millions of dollars to create an you know, incre incredible web of content and then we should tell no one it exists. And my <laughs> boss said, that's the dumbest thing I've, I've ever heard. Um, that's just throwing money away. I'm not, we're not going to do that. And I said, OK. And then I went to uh, Spielberg and Kennedy, and I told them the idea. And they were intrigued, because they're storytellers. And the idea of telling story in a different way was very exciting to them. You know? uh, and they said, well, yeah, that's awesome. Are you going to do it? And I said, well, we think it can promote both the movie and the game. And so we were thinking that you know, we could split the expense between Warner Brothers and Microsoft. And they said, sure. You know? uh, and I said, OK, but there's this little budgetary thing where Microsoft doesn't have its money right now. <laughs> so can Warner Brothers fund its part? And then Microsoft will fund the second part. And they're like, sure. So one of my favorite phone calls of all time, Kathleen Kennedy gets on the phone, calls the head of marketing of Warner Brothers and says, I'm sending this guy over. You're going to write him this multi-million dollar check, and you're not allowed to ask what it's for. <laughs> Which only she could pull off, I think, uniquely in the world. You know? um, and so we did that. And then um, we did the whole campaign. Did a very, it was very, very secret, because we didn't want anybody to know what we were doing. A, because I was told not to do it, and B, because the whole idea was no one was supposed to know who did it. Um, and then my boss eventually walks in with a, um, my boss's boss walks in with a copy of this big New York Times article about it, which was, a, you know, it had gone out, it had reached millions of people, and it was really doing well. And he comes in and says, I thought I said we weren't doing this. And I was like, I'm, I'm misunderstood. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you just didn't have the money now. But now you're going to have the money to pay the second half, right? So yes, that's how the first one got done, through larceny. OK. Um, but after that one worked, then when they got to Halo 2, uh, I, I, at that point I had left um, Microsoft and had uh, my little, the little company 42 Entertainment. They called us and said, hey, could you do one of those for the launch of Halo 2? So, but I should say, ARGs are very, very specific animals. And they are, um, uh, over time, they've had to change an enormous amount too, right? What we learned is that, because we've done, we did all these kind of big high profile story experiences, and we also did things for like Toyota and for you know, Dove Soap and all these other ones, right? And the truth is, you have to realize that ARGs ask an enormous amount from their audience. This is a format, it's kind of like a rock concert, right? It's, it, it's not, it, but it's like a rock concert where the album sucks. So you either experience it live, or you shouldn't experience it at all. Um, and so that means it asks a lot from the audience. It's the opposite of all the, uh, the direction of all entertainment is going, which is, which is I want entertainment on when I want it, and, and I want to be able to binge it, I want to be able to, you know. This is, no, you have to stop what you're doing and pay attention to this now. That's a huge ask, even more so now than it was 20 years ago. But even 20 years ago, it was a big ask, right? Um, and so what we learned is that if you don't have something that people already emotionally care about, they're not going to do that, right? It's too big an ask for just curiosity. So it works great for Batman. It worked great for Trent Reznor. It worked great for things that people already care about. It works much less effectively when you're trying to get them to care about something. Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so 
humans are really, really sensitive to randomness and trying to find patterns in that. So when it comes to tabletop games, what is your favorite dice to design around? The actual physical dice, or, or yeah. just the physical, or mechanics? Uh, either, either or. Um, wow. Uh, I guess I, you know, um, to me, mechanics serve an end, right? It, the, ult the ultimate game mechanic, whether it's in a tabletop game or a video game, is one you stop noticing, right? It should, get, it should facilitate the socialization, it should facilitate the storytelling, and it should get out of the way, right? Um, so anytime that you're too busy spending time on the mechanic, to me, that's not a mechanic that, um, that I think is a great mechanic. Now, admittedly, this opinion has changed over 40 years, right? When you're a young designer, what you're trying to do is prove how smart you are by you know, creating these enormously complex mechanics that model everything in great, in great detail. Um, and then when you, you know, as you get older, you start realizing, actually, what I need to do is much less. <laughs> it's much harder, but it's much less, right? And the ability to kind of create mechanics that are as lightweight as possible, right? And get out of the way as much. So it's all about elegance as opposed to um, depth, right? At least in my gray beard years, that's what I'm thinking. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. So, when you know, you've been doing games from like a very high level and then filtering them down, have you done anything with having people create games and then sort of filter up and share uh, their experiences with other people? So you've got like people making um, mechanics and then the stories and then turning those into games. So it sort of creates a community of game creators. And how how do you see that being facilitated in a way that could be successful? Um. So I think uh, I haven't done kind of a crowdsourced game design, if you will. And that idea is both fascinating and really frightening. <laughs> um, because uh, in some respect, I mean, I, you know, having kind of hypothesized the, the creation of the hive mind, which is what ARGs were all about, like trying to, can we, if we, the original premise when we were doing The Beast was, well, if we had a couple hundred thousand people play, um, and they each you know, went to their friends that we could get like every knowledge base in the planet represented. And those people as a collective would be able to solve anything, right? So it was a very different way to have to design because you're designing not for an individual, but for basically God on earth, you know? Um, so I totally believe in that, in that ability, but that is different um, than trying to charge them to create a unique experience as opposed to assemble and reassemble an experience in that regard. Because when I've seen, I would be both fascinated and afraid of it because would you end up with um, that elegance or would you end up with kind of, you know, a statue designed by a committee, right? Um, the, uh, I, we, a lot of the experiences, and I would say so much of like, whenever you do like a tabletop RPG or when, like, when we did our, uh, uh, at my new little studio, when we do an RPG and we release the, the content creation tools, we are, in some respect, empowering the audience to make all of their own games, right? And often what they make is better than what we made with our same set of tools, right? Um, but then they, and then they share that with each other. But it's different than aggregating it, like what, like what your question was, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure if I actually answered your question. Okay, all right, good. Is there any other question I can confusedly answer? <laughs> So as the games get more realistic and the tools get more accessible, what should society do about people putting real people into games and doing bad things to them? You know, where, where you can have some weird person scrape the face of somebody next door off Instagram and model that onto a 3D character and do, you know, whatever. Yeah, so um, this is something that's been concerning me for, for a very long time. Uh, you know, back when we did the first Battletech Center, uh, and um, uh, it was the first network game, so it was the first multiplayer game at the time, I mean, at period, that was available to the public. Um, and even right at that start, people started being concerned about, what is this in terms of, you know, can, do we have to be worried about that reproducible violence? Do we have to be worried about um, the, the kind of, you know, uncanny valley breaking down to where it is photoreal. And um, obviously the industry has a wide range of, of beliefs on this. My personal one is I've never, I've tried to always avoid doing a game which 
which has reproducible violence. So I'll design games with giant mechs because I'm not really worried about some kid building a giant mech and going out and killing someone else with it, you know, uh, or magic spells or, or things like that. Um, that's just my personal opinion. But I do think that, that um, you know, we, we live in a very complex time, right? Just even, even outside of the context of games, being able to uh, take people's faces, put them onto different people in film and, and create things that never happened, right? This whole kind of blurring of reality um, or what is the definition of reality. To me, as an old folk, is a pretty scary thing. Um, so I, I don't have an answer to that except for it to be kind of as concerned as you are. Um, I don't know how we, I don't know how we um, deal with those concerns. Do we try to legislate to those concerns? Um, that's a very complicated place to go because, and, you know, censorship gets to be a ball that can, you know, pick up speed and become, you know, uh, much, become an avalanche, you know. Um, I, I think in our society, what speaks loudest is money, right? If we don't support those enterprises, then, then that's how we can speak um, to that, to the best, best ability. But I, unfortunately, I don't have good answers for how to deal with it, except for to be equally concerned and, you know, vote with my dollars. We're relying on money to uh, keep it from happening. That's, that's the opposite of what will happen. I mean, that's, that, the whole PCR industry started because of porn, so the money goes towards that stuff, not away from it. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been quoted before as saying all communication technologies are invented for the transmission of pornographic images and other uses are eventually found. Um, and I think it's true. Um, and, but when those other uses, and, and, and I mean, you know, if you look at the internet, right, porn never went away on the internet. But it's, um, but in, in terms of the percentage of money being developed for that versus other things on the internet, it's dwarfed. I don't have a good answer for you. Sorry. Other question? Yeah. So through most of history, the stories that people have told have been fairly, they had a beginning, they had a middle, they had an end, and it was the same story repeated. So, you know, the, the storyteller would tell the story and then their children would tell the story and, and so on. We've changed now the art of story where it morphs depending on the action that the person hearing it takes, uh, like in uh, role-playing games or any number of games where you do something that affects the rest of the story. So it's no longer a set linear story. You don't know, even the storyteller doesn't necessarily know the ending. Right. How do you see that changing future generations of story? Where do you think this is going to go? It's pretty unprecedented in, in human history of, of telling stories where this happens, it seems. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, so I would, I would take one, um, I would differ a little bit in saying in terms of it's unprecedented. Because I, I kind of view it as a return. Um, I mean, storytelling started around the fire. Right, right. I mean, we, you know, we'd come back from our mammalian hunts, and we would tell stories about them. About you know, the one that got away was this big, um, and uh, and that story. When you're telling a story face to face of people, um, you automatically adopt the story to your storytelling to the audience. Right. It is it is an intimate experience. It is by by nature a collaborative storytelling. Even though only one person may be speaking. They are speaking and reacting to the audience, and they will tell the story differently. Like if you think about the traveling bards that would move from town to town and sing the stories, they wouldn't sing it the same in every town, right? They're going to sing it differently based upon what they're, what their action they're getting in each town. We, over centuries, that that got farther and farther away, right? We went to a more and more top-down distribution of story, where story was being created, kind of in absence of its audience, and then distributed to the audience in a way that was not now reactive to the audience. Um, I view it that we have over the last couple of decades now kind of returned to the fireplace, right? To, to, to being around the fire pit, where we now have the ability for stories that have the kind of medium uh, and, and the fidelity, if you will, visual fidelity and so on, that, that previously non-reactive uh, entertainment had that now can be reactive to its audience, um, whether that is a group or an individual. Um, I think that, that trend is going to continue, all right? Um, I think that 
if we look at, you know, for better or for worse, we, we all live in increasingly smaller reflective bubbles of our own reality, right? Um, and our entertainment is going to likely continue to reflect that, right? Um, I think that there is some interesting, I think there's danger in that, but I also think there's some interesting opportunities in that, right? Some of the things that, that we've been playing with, and, and some of this goes all the way back to like the early 90s, is um, that uh, right now, like in a lot of my universes, like the Battletech universe or Shadowrun and so on, we've done hundreds of novels, right? And those novels are great ways to immerse yourself in the world, have character experiences, and they definitely enrich, when, enrich your gameplay when you play the game because you bring some of that mental imagery with you, especially in the early days when everything on screen looked like crap. Well, it looked a lot better when you read this book and it had all these wonderful pictures in your head, right? Um, but what if the book you're reading included a reaction to the game you were just playing, right? So that, because if you will, the History, over my 40 years, we've seen a complete collapse of, uh, of the distribution mechanisms, right? It used to be that you would buy your book one place, you'd buy your, go see a movie someplace, you'd see, you know, your community, which would be, you know, at a physical convention, a third place, your video game, a fourth place. And these things were really different industries and really different distribution mediums. Now, they're all the same distribution medium. They're all on your phone, they're all on your tablet, they're all on your PC, all right? But yet, we still artificially just we still have to break them apart, right? They're still because of kind of a legacy of, of, of the, the vertical industries that, that were created to create these kinds of, of entertainment. I, one of the things I'm excited about, if I live long enough, is being able to try to break down those walls, that the, the game I'm playing influences the book I'm reading, influences the TV show I'm watching, you know, in, in a really interesting kind of virtuous circle. Um, so it becomes even more reactive um, uh, to the audience, whether that's an audience of an individual or a group. Um, what's one of your favorite games that you haven't contributed to, uh, contributed to personally? Um, well, it's a long list, uh, and it depends on the um, uh, it depends on the circumstance. I mean, obviously, there's the ones that were most formative to me as a as a child. Um, you know, and a young adult like uh, D and D or Traveler, uh, things like that, which you know, kind of changed my life. Uh, you know, over the last couple of decades, um, the you know the the games that have been I think the most emotionally impactful for me are actually tabletop social games, right? Um, playing where you know things like uh, Code Names or or other games where you know it's about understanding each other. Right, so Code Names is a, is a great little board game. If you haven't picked it up, it's a, it's a wonderful one for parties because it really can scale really large. It's a very simple concept. There are a grid of 25 words or phrases on the table. And there, um, each team has one clue giver. And the clue giver can say a single word and how many cards they think, um, that, they, that they think that word applies to. And the rest of their team has to successfully guess the words on the table. So the more you understand about the person who gave the clue, right, the better you're going to be at, understand, at being able to guess that. And so it's a really great kind of social experience, right? Um, so there's a whole camp of that kind of what I call communication games that, that, at least at our house, we really enjoy. We come back to them all the time. So, um, so I think it, like, it's like, what's your favorite movie? Well, what age am I, <laughs> right? What's your favorite game? It's kind of like, well, where am I in my life? Am I, am I, you know, am I still able to spend 50 hours playing an RPG by myself in my living room, or am I you know, wanting to engage with my kids when they come over for dinner. You know, so I think it, it's, it's always, like all things, it's a, a spectrum. Yeah. One, more, one, more, just one more question. Uh, one more question, okay. Hey, um, thanks so much for speaking. You said something when you were giving your talk, you mentioned a target audience of 18 to 35 year old men, right? Um, and it kind of struck me because over 10 years ago, I worked on ad campaigns for PlayStation and PlayStation games. And at the time, it was basically the same target audience of 16 to 35 year old guys. And I tried very hard to make the case where it's like, hey, let's open up this target audience. Let's start talking to women. They're ready. They're playing games. They actually, at Absolutely. the time, made up a higher percentage of online gamers. Yeah. Things that we think of now as like app games, like Candy Crush and these little games. So it struck me because I was like, 
oh geez, is that still the target audience? Or where are we right, where are we at now with women in gaming, whether it's in the industry or as a target audience? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, the, that, that, that story was um, 20 years ago, right? So it was very much what the target audience for a new console device at that time was considered to be. Um, that war has already been won, right? Uh, women represent the dominant economic force in gaming at the moment, right? Because, um, you know, mobile games uh, generate more money than any of the console games uh, do, um, and as a, as a segment of the industry, represents more than all the consoles combined. Um, and, you know, mobile games are predominantly women, uh, in terms of especially those who monetize versus those who don't. So, I mean, that, luckily the revolution has already happened. There are parts of the industry that don't recognize that still, right? Like, for instance, the, you know, the consoles are kind of a, a holdout um, because they, the consoles uh, speak to a very specific type of gaming, right? They've evolved um, to, to be, rather than used to be, that every kind of game was played on console because the console was the only place you played games. That is, you know, very not true now. And so the consoles have primarily, not including like, like the Switch and stuff, which is much broader, but, you know, if you look at like Xbox and Sony, they, majority of the revenue is driven on a very narrow, narrow category of game, which speaks to a narrower, a narrower demographic. You know? uh, even that demographic has increased in its female participation, right? In, the, in terms of like the shooters and things like that. Uh, even there, you've seen a, a significant growth in, in, in female uh, participation in that. So I think it is, um, to me, that's fantastic <laughs> and exciting. Um, I think that the, uh, the kinds of games that we can make um, uh, as, a, as an industry is great. Now what we need to do is be much more supportive of women making those games, right? Um, there has still uh, been all sorts of backlash and, and, and both you know, structural and, and kind of societal challenges to be as supportive as we need to be about women being the creators of these games. Um, but, but I think we're on the right track. You know, it's been frustrating, but it's, we're on the right track. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.